I grew up in a gold mining town in South Africa. Sometimes as I walked to school across the felt, my path would cross that of the black miners. White people called them mine boys. They were grown men. I was taught to fear them. I didn't know why. To me, they were foreign, exotic. Later, I realized it was myself, a white girl, who was exotic in Africa. I had been taught that blacks were dangerous. I lived within the frontier of my mind. They were on the other side. physical frontier between white-dominated South Africa and black Mozambique is a frontier of electrified fences and razor wire traps. The soldiers are guarding the border between Komati Port in South Africa and Rosano Garcia in Mozambique, a border that for some means economic survival, for others, death. Remember Rosana Garcia as the rundown frontier to Mozambique on holiday. When the Portuguese still controlled Mozambique before the 1975 revolution, thousands of white South Africans used to pour across the frontier, leaving their prudery and racist inhibitions behind. Gambling and sex between black and white were outlawed in South Africa. In Mozambique, there were casinos and you could take your pick of flesh of any color. On Tuesdays, suddenly the town is transformed it's then that a special train arrives, bringing back the contract laborers from the mines in South Africa. Most of these men have been away from their homes in Mozambique for 10 months without wives or family. Mozambican men have helped to make racist South Africa rich. For almost a century, Mozambique has been used as a labor pool for South Africa. In the 1980s, over 63,000 Mozambicans were working in the South African mines. Why do these men go to work in the dark catacombs of another country? Look at what they bring back. They also bring back money they couldn't have earned at home the hard currency of South African rants, untold wealth in a land of the poor. Exchanged for Mozambican metikash, it becomes bulky mounds of paper. You have to be ingenious to conceal it. Many miners are robbed long before they reach home, but part of their earnings is beyond the reach of bandits. It's paid to the Mozambican government in bullion, a trade of black man's labor for white man's gold that has survived colonial times. Mm -hmm. 
First, they have to get home, whether by rail or road, and they may never reach there. They're about to risk their lives on a journey through a landscape made murderous by civil war. It's a war in which rebel forces called Renamo have been armed, trained and supported from across the frontier by my country, South Africa. In 1984, right here on the frontier, a few hundred yards from the station, the presidents of South Africa and Mozambique met to sign an agreement, the Nkomati Accord. To honor the occasion, a thousand crayfish tails were flown in, with nine tons of ice to cool the champagne and beer. President Boerter promised an end to support for Mozambique's rebels in exchange for President Michel's assurance that the principal black liberation movement in South Africa the banned African National Congress would not operate from Mozambique. Mrs. Boerter wore pink because she confided it was a friendly color. Our meeting today on the border between our two countries indicates our willingness and our ability to reach peaceful accords. Each country has the right to order its affairs at its seen fit. Neither South Africa nor Mozambique had a hand in drawing the political map as we know it today. This frontier emerged from the wrangling of 19th century imperial powers over the spoils of southern Africa. The line which divided Portuguese Mozambique from Boer and British South Africa now divides the richest country in Africa from the poorest the richest city from the poorest. Then it was drawn through the hunting grounds of the great Shangan African Kingdom. I started my journey at the northernmost point of the frontier. For the people who lived here, the drawing of the frontier ended their independence and their freedom of movement and made them work for the white man on both sides of the frontier. Their traditional hunting skills were forced into the service of white ivory traders. But once gold was discovered, it was men the Europeans wanted. A trade in labor was built up by white adventurers who took so much for every pair of hands they delivered to the mines. Blacks from Mozambique would make their way to this great baobab tree to be recruited. These young men soon became so many units of labor. The alternative to the mines was forced labor back home under the Portuguese. They would be herded like cattle into this pit to be disinfected. <laughs> Built in the felt near the mine shafts, these are the quarters they were brought to by donkey cart or on foot. Inside these barracks, they would live isolated from everything around them for up to a year at a stretch, sometimes 40 to a dormitory. Summer and winter, they slept on these concrete shelves. No mattresses, no privacy. Today, they are well housed and better paid, but still live out most of their lives without home, wife or family. These were the men I used to see robed in bright blankets, their hair in clay-covered locks. The men I used to meet with wonder and fear when I was a child on the felt. I traveled through what had once been the ancestral Shangan Kingdom. The forced removal of these people began when President Kruger founded the Kruger Game Park. The greater stretch of the frontier on the South African side was turned into a buffer state of wild animals between Mozambique and South Africa. The human frontiersmen on the sections of the frontier outside the park are white farmers with a particular lifestyle. 
This comes from the game camp. You, you sh shot this line yes, yourself? Yes, yes. It comes Most in of from, these trophies? Most of these trophies were shot by myself and it comes from the farm. The kudu does. What about the, the leopard? The leopard, it came in from the Kruger National Park. Unfortunately, culled them. It's an amazing collection. Johnny Hennis is a farmer, businessman, hunter and loyal supporter of the National Party. He lives in a house of dead animals. <laughs> I see, just There's in case the there aren't enough real animals around, you've surprised There's some fiberglass. Some fiberglass ones. When you're... Fiberglass kudu. That's right. When you're in the bathroom, it's a one-way window. Yes. Then you look over... Johnny Hennis has built his own tourist resort, decked out with plastic animals, on land he owns as far as the horizon. He's also mayor of the frontier town of Kamati Put. And where's the border from here? The border, uh, if you're lucky, we can maybe see it from here. There's the mountains, the Labombo Mountains, that's the border with Mozambique. I was going back to Mozambique for the first time after 30 years. From the plain, I could see the deep slash of the electrified fence that divides lush cultivation on the South African side from the devastated villages on the Mozambican side. No crops, no people. The capital, Maputo, was still white and gleaming. It seemed intact, but the ride from the airport to town brought me back to present reality with a jolt. The road was a hazardous dodgem. In 1975, the Front for the Liberation of Mozambique, Frilimo, won independence from the Portuguese after a 12-year war. I passed the undulating wall, painted by Mozambican artists as a monument to their liberation and their new Marxist government, and to the hopes which have been and still are being destroyed by civil war. This was where I stayed when I came to the city for the first time on a honeymoon, the Palana Hotel. That was in 1949. Like all white South Africans, I regarded it as the height of sybaritic luxury. After all, didn't the Aga Khan bring Rita Hayworth there? It's still the Polana. It still has a certain authority in the Hollywood idiom in which it was conceived. Looking out from its beautiful headland, it's easy to ignore the war-ruined city shut out behind me. Maputo was called Lorenzo Marques under the Portuguese regime. South Africans would talk of popping over here in the way the British used to talk of popping over to the continent. A character in my novel, A Sport of Nature, says this about her sister. She went on holiday to Lorenzo Marques, and she fell in love with that wailing fardo. She fell in love with the sleazy dockside nightclubs, the sexuality and humidity, the freedom of the prostitutes. That's what she kept going back for, to wash off the Calvinism and koshering of South Africa. She was all our colonial bourgeois illusions rolled into one. She thought that was Europe, Latin. She thought it was European culture. This was one of the beach cafes where tourists stuffed themselves with prawns and beer. When the Portuguese left, the whole facade that hid the country's underdevelopment collapsed, leaving the people's revolution staggering under the burden of poverty and lack of skills. I didn't come as a tourist this time. There are no more tourists from South Africa. It's the migrant workers who maintain the links between the two countries. I went to find Albino Paisia, the friend of a Mozambican migrant worker I know back in Johannesburg. 
I'd expected him to be at the Polano where he was head waiter, but it was his day off. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Surprise. Thank Coming you. to see you all. Thank you very Jane much. To welcome. So I'm here. <laughs> yes, you're at home. How did you know I was supposed to come to the hotel? <laughs> No, no, I'd like to give you the presents that Thomas gave me to give when, you. When the most, uh... What an enormous contrast. The old, unchanged colonial contrast between the place where he worked and the place he lived in. Very nice. Ah, oh, no. <laughs> Just nice. Not very nice. I think it's nice. The gifts I brought, soap and toothpaste, were in short supply in Mozambique. Expensive luxuries, even for a man holding down a prized job at the Polana Hotel. It's too much. Yeah, too, much. too expensive. Yeah. <coughs> this is the latest. Everything is very expensive. And this too, the toothpaste. Mm -hmm. yeah. But before, was small pay, but everything was cheap. Of course, and now. The next day, an immaculate albino showed me to my table. Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you. So now I see you at work. Good. <laughs> I don't know what to do to eat. Do I put a nice menu here? Let me have a look. The hotel somehow survives in its total inappropriateness, housing aid missions and international bankers come to revive Mozambique's collapsed economy. Long, long ago, 1970 was the last time I was here. Yes, when my son was at school in Swaziland, we used to pick him up and come to and spend a holiday. But not in this hotel, it was too expensive. We used to go to Costa da Sol with the children. Mm. This is a company of foreigners. The only Mozambicans, apart from the Legion of Waiters, are government officials entertaining foreign VIPs. You can't order so much as a piece of bread without foreign currency. But decisions vital to the country's revival may be made on this terrace, over attaché cases, wine and prawns. Money is flowing in from Western countries as freely now as from the Soviet Union, Mozambique's traditional source of aid. Ironically, the most important donor nowadays is South Africa. She's investing 48 million rants in projects such as the improvement of Maputo's port. But this is a donor with a record of giving with one hand while destabilizing the regime with the other. Maputo's grand station is a fossil of colonial pomp. Trains are rare. This one is pushing an earth-filled truck to smother any bombs placed on the track. It's come from the frontier, packed with migrant workers who boarded at Rosano Garcia. It's been an anxious journey with the danger of ambush round every bend. Excitement and tension make a hullabaloo of men amid the baggage. But these are the lucky ones. The trains on this line have been attacked four times in a month. On New Year's Eve 1987, a train carrying about 1,500 mine workers struck a landmine only 25 miles from the frontier. 22 men died then, and there have been many such attacks since. The attacks are the work of the rebel army known as Renamo. It was first formed by disgruntled Portuguese with a splinter group of Mozambicans who'd broken away from Frelimo, the Marxist regime, and aimed to take power themselves. The rebels learned their ugly trade in Ian Smith's Rhodesia. Later, they were taken up by South Africa and became the brutal instrument of a plan to destabilize the Marxist state next door. <laughs> this man has made it back home to his wife and family, and they're alive. The last time he returned, he found his village burned down 
and his wife and children existing in the bush. Out of his baggage, all the way from Johannesburg, comes a whole new life for them. Pants, nightgowns, blue paper, an umbrella, hair dye, aspirins and bras. I've driven along this road on holiday with my children. It isn't possible to travel it now without a military escort. It's not a road, it's a battlefield. There's overwhelming evidence that this destruction of the countryside, now almost empty of people, is the work of Renamo. An American State Department's official report found that 94% of civilian killings could be ascribed to Renamo, and only 3% to Frelimo, the government troops. I was now approaching a lookout post on the frontier. The South Africans justify the fence by saying it's to prevent African National Congress infiltration from Mozambique. It's true that there have been isolated South African deaths from attacks attributed to the ANC, but as I was to see, many more Mozambicans have died because of the very existence of the fence. All this on the frontier where President Boerta had pledged himself to peace. We have opted for the road of peace. We can explore numerous possibilities for expanding our relations. For mutual benefit in the atmosphere of peace and trust that we are now creating. Now I was at the electrified fence that stood in place of peace and trust between the two countries. The only monument to the 1984 Nkomati Peace Accord is this rubbish dump on the spot where Boerta spoke. In a sleazy hotel room back in Maputo, there's a man who knows why. He is Paolo Oliveira, representative of Renamo in Europe, who has defected to the Mozambican government. I'd heard about him. I found him to be the most haunted human being I've ever met. Mr. Paolo Oliveira. Yes, yes. I'm the person who telephoned you. He was to tell me how, even as the two presidents prepared to sign the peace accord with gold pens, the South African Defence Force was pouring military supplies into Renamo bases in Mozambique. Each plane could uh, handle uh, 10 tons of cargo. And uh, Days before Nkomati, for instance, they put 10, 10 planes a night inside Mozambique, one to each province. The planes used to leave South Africa after the sunset, and we made a big fire there in the camp, and we were awake till the planes were returning to South Africa. I set out to find what had once been the Renamo headquarters on an old plantation. It had been captured from them by Frelimo, the Mozambican army, with the help of Zimbabwean troops. Now completely cut off by road, this is the refuge for 12,000 homeless and destitute refugees. The American State Department report estimates that Renamo has murdered at least 100,000 people by forced drowning, axing, knifing, bayoneting and burning alive. These people have known unspeakable horror and live in it still. There's an unearthly silence over the place. This family arrived exhausted last night and were decked out in the uniform of flowery charity dresses. Like so many others, they've been used as slave labour by Renamo. Now, 
young girls with 12 and 13 years, they put there in the Renamo army. And they were beaten up. They uh, were obliged to maintain uh, relations with uh, the Renamo commander. When I tried to solve uh, one You of heard about this when you were in at Palabora camp? No, I saw that. You saw it? Even in the uh, Palabora camp. This man arrived while we were in the camp. He hadn't eaten for four weeks. I take a on from the young, Penego, Mon, Jabudembo was a Dodo Bereda man, the Guacunum Boganga man, Moon, Mon Gumana Matanga, Muro de Muleman, Mona da Gona, Mukweza Musteradam, Mona Manj, Mutanga Kurum, Chicago de Jete Fesia, Fanba, Mona Manj, even Bundiwomba, that they could be the Kira Jar, Tibata Apache. Majuanamani, <laughs> One of the people tied to him had been dead for two weeks. What was the attitude of the South Africans with whom you were associated there toward these atrocities? atrocities. No, I think that uh, they did not stop Renam or Blakama to do that. They yeah. knew about it and they, they did not they stop. They knew uh, about that. Even in South Africa, for instance, <coughs> I knew a Portuguese guy. He was a staff sergeant in the South Africa Defense Forces. And uh, he had no problems to claim atrocities that uh, himself, he, he made here in uh, Mozambique. He had no shame to tell me that uh, he liked to throw phosphor grenades inside the uh, houses and see people burning. The camp was now guarded by Zimbabwean troops. In 1985, when they helped destroy Renamo headquarters here, well after the Incomati Peace Accord, a diary was found which revealed that South Africa was still supporting Renamo. It listed names of South African politicians and military who came here, dates and places where arms were flown in. There were reports of continuing South African support in 1989. Paulo Oliveira was in charge of a communication system set up by South Africa between Renamo leaders in Portugal and the South African military. All that equipment, fax machine, the communications equipment is still running in Lisbon and connected with South Africa. These people are beyond caring who supplies their torturers. At least five die here every day. Whether or not South Africa is continuing to support Renamo, a monster of destruction has become rampant. It has attracted to itself mercenaries, bandits, all who exult even beyond politics and profit in the power of killing. And people when uh, are uh, forced to join Renamo and uh, are given the weapons and uh, told to shoot people. I think that they feel they are in the hell and they are contaminated. And uh, once that they start, they feel that they are marked. And then they start to not have any moral feel feelings nor auto censorship. The tragedy for Mozambique is that its next generation is so desperately damaged. The brutalization and malnourishment of the children in the rural areas is such that the majority of children I met appeared to be physically or mentally crippled, perhaps for life. I 
flew back from this human wasteland in shame and horror at what my country had done. I flew over the spot where, in October 1986, Samora Machel, Mozambique's president, was killed when his plane hit the ground just on the South African side of the frontier. Mozambicans and many others believe South Africa was involved in the mystery of the crash. Whatever the truth may be, the tragedy brought to the presidency Joachim Chisano, which South Africa welcomed. Michelle's successor has had to accept the bitter necessity of a negotiated peace with Renamo on what are likely to be South Africa's terms. On the hillside where the plane crashed, the people of the so-called homeland, Kangwani, erected a monument to Michelle. I was taken there by the chief minister, Inos Mabuza. Because our people here regarded Samora Machel as their leader as well. And, and in fact, Samora Machel had inspired our people by his nationalist leadership qualities and uh, the fact that Mozambique became an independent country and the Mozambicans became free people, inspired our own people that one day they would also be as free as, as the Mozambicans are. But a South Africa and a non-racial majority rule is something most of the white farmers along the frontier are dedicated to preventing. Hans Cronier farms on the border just a few miles from where Michelle's plane crashed. He belongs to the Afrikaners' extreme right-wing conservative party. He's a God-fearing man. Medium, and I've got. Hannes Cronier is generous and welcoming. Drink it in Transvaal, red and cold, dry, red, cold. That's fantastic. You, you never experience it in this weather of us. You know, that's why the Cape Townians, they can't believe their eyes. We put the red wine in... Hannes Cronier supports Renamo. I see Renamo as also a freedom power. Renamo is also fighting for the indigenous people in Mozambique. You know, there was a time that we South Africans supported Renamo. And I would say it, it wasn't such an fortunate day when we decided to withdraw all our help from Renamo. You think we should have continued to help Renamo? Yes, and try and bring the two fighting parties together. And I will not see it as breaking the Kumati Accord if we still support the Renamo movement. Because Chisano will never become a positive Western ally. So the solution you could see is something that seems to be coming now, and that is yeah. that Chisano and his government are reduced to such desperate straits yes. that you think that they will then have to talk to Renama. Yes. Would you give your life to keep South Africa white? Yes, definitely. This is the place where I live. My ancestors got over with their wagons. Now they took months to get from Maputo, where they got their load from, up to the Johannesburg or wherever. All that sweat, all that suffering, all that facing of dangers, of no roads available. Going through that stretched country. And my national anthem takes all these things into consideration. This is what I, Afrikaner, 
is. This is all what I want to be. <laughs> I don't want to be anything or any person else. I am 100% satisfied. Mr. Cronier is a man who's built everything in his life, his house, his furniture, and an insurmountable frontier inside his own head. Across the border from Hannes Cronier's farm, there stretches the scorching wilderness Mozambicans trek through for days on end to seek survival in South Africa. The refugees come in their thousands, fleeing from the enemy to the enemy, from Renamo to the country of Renamo's allies. On the way, they must evade soldiers and game wardens and brave electrified fences and wild animals. Some die. It's just an alternative to death or starvation at home. Many refugees are led across the border by illegal guides who regularly bring groups from Mozambique through the Kruger Park. Over a million people have fled to neighboring countries, including South Africa. The exodus continues. One night, when we had stopped, someone slept up a tree and the lion came and ate his shoes. But the babies are the worst problem. They make a noise, especially when they are hungry, and they have to go under the fence. Then the mother gives the baby to someone else. The baby objects and starts to cry. Our guide demonstrated on one of the game fences how he gets people through those erected against human passage. The sticks must be forked and absolutely dry. This guide's route involves getting through the frontier fence and several game fences like this one. The actual frontier fence carries a deadly 11,500 volts. South Africa classifies these people as illegal immigrants, not refugees. Unless they are lucky enough to reach one of what apartheid calls the black homelands, they are transported back across the frontier to Mozambique. Those who don't clear the fence are left in the sun to rot. None has ever been identified as an ANC freedom fighter. Many refugees are maimed. I've met one person who was able to get through this razor wire and to get through this deadly electrified. He was cut very badly, his whole body. Once it caught you, you can't go forward and you can't go back and you can, can only go forward by letting this wire cut through your flesh. That's the only way. Well, uh, asking him now, why are you prepared to go through all this? Mm. They, what is it that drives you? <clears throat> and he said to get work and to get something to eat. <laughs> The refugees who manage to reach Gazankulu are taken in as relatives with a common ancestry and language dating from before the white invaders drew the frontier. The Catholic Church and Operation Hunger, a private South African charity, provide clothes and food. Inside a blue and white circus tent, I find 211 people are housed. 
They've crammed a kind of village into it. The crowding is appalling. Yet there's a dignified attempt at privacy. Somehow the structures of a lost home are being recalled in here. No one's willing to talk about the future. To have achieved the survival of their children is enough. The hospitality shown towards the refugees is tolerated by the South African government on condition they do not seek work outside. Solomon Ngubani's daughter was murdered by Ranamo. He and his wife fled with their orphaned grandchildren. Say <laughs> By carrying bricks on a building site, the grandmothers managed to buy her grandchildren real school shoes. Every morning, they are polished in the tiny space where the family has slept head to foot. The people of Gazankulu are poor enough themselves, but they've given these refugees a piece of land and share with them their community life, their clinic and their school. Despite the poverty, this is a place of life. I thought of Casa Banana, a place of death. In the last recorded year, 1988, 33,000 Mozambican refugees were sent back. This man's despair is awesome, even to a child. At 5.30 every day, the deportations continue, but the refugees usually risk their lives trying all over again. I remembered what it was they were going back to. We'd seen how every morning beside the railway line in Maputo, people would pick up grain by grain maize that had fallen from some wagon carrying food aid. <laughs> but these hungry Mozambicans are a resourceful people. Portuguese exploitation in colonial times, the Liberation War, Michelle's overzealous attempt at instant socialism, civil war, and above all, the destructive interference of South Africa. All this has meant that the people's revolution never had a chance. But as Samora Michelle reminded his people, we are a continent of survivors. Finally, my zigzag journey took me to the limits of the 400-mile frontier where it is lost in the Indian Ocean. I went by a hired military helicopter. No other means of communication existed. The land below was drained of life. A white Mozambican businessman hitched an uninvited lift with us. As we approached the coast, we saw villas which had been abandoned for years. Most of them didn't belong to Mozambicans or even the Portuguese. They were the holiday homes of South Africans. This was once their Rivera. The 
Tora, Golden Headland. That's where the frontier ends. This deserted hotel turned out to belong to our hitchhiker, Antonio Latayo. He hadn't seen it for four years. Amazingly, his old staff appeared out of nowhere. He inspected the ghostly corridors and empty kitchens, and he even ordered the staff around. The problem was to find glasses for all the drinks he'd brought with him. The staff dutifully made a fire and chickens the Frilimo Major had brought along. While the hungry local people live in fear of Renamo, completely cut off from food supplies, this bizarre ghost of a colonial feast was taking place. <laughs> A leftover chicken, still clucking, was taken back to Maputo. People materialized around the helicopter, hoping to get away with us. Natao took a lingering last look at his hotel. And all that was left was a few Mozambican children in an abandoned playground of foreigners. There can be no peace in Mozambique without an end to Renamo. There can be no end to Renamo without an end to support from South Africa. President Chisano once said, I will not talk to murderers. Yet under the pressure of his country's plight, he has now agreed to talk to Renamo. He has also had to say he accepts that the South African government no longer supports them. But he adds that support still comes from someone, somewhere in South Africa. The consequences of this frontier, drawn across an old African kingdom, are still unfolding. In the end, it's the frontier my country tried to set up in me when I was a child. Distrust of white for black. The frontier between haves and have-nots. And that one has to come down on both sides. Ya <laughs> 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 